On a warm spring afternoon in April of 1986, 19-year-old Pamela Dawn Tinsley took a short drive down to Lake Overholzer, one of her favorite spots to get away from the stress of life and enjoy a relaxing day by the water. She could never have imagined that she'd never make it back home. According to Pam's friends who were present that day, she hopped on the back of a motorcycle with an unknown man for a ride around the lake from which she never returned. For investigators, it was a difficult case. Had Pam been abducted by the unknown motorcyclist or had she run off with him intentionally? There was never any doubt for her family who believed that if Pam could have made it home, she would have. Something terrible had to have happened. The story itself never made a great deal of sense. Pam wasn't the type to just take a ride with a stranger. And if her friends were so concerned about her, why didn't they tell anyone she'd seemingly disappeared? As it turned out, the term friend may have been exaggerated a bit. In reality, the only witnesses to Pam's disappearance were a group of people who may have had reasons to want to see her gone. Was Pam Tinsley truly abducted by an unknown man on a motorcycle? Or is it possible that the truth of her mysterious disappearance lies with those she spent her last hours with, the very people she desperately wanted out of her life? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 196, The Disappearance of Pamela Tinsley. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the mysterious disappearance of Pamela Tinsley, a case with so many different layers and twists, it's hard to know what exactly was going on. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod. Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com. 19-year-old Pamela Tinsley was in the midst of a crisis in her life. Hoping to take a day to escape from it all, she went down to her favorite place to relax and never came home. For decades, investigators believed that she'd been abducted by a total stranger, but a series of calls from an anonymous tipster may have revealed that Pam's abductors might not have been strangers, but instead the very people who claim to be her friends. This is episode 196, The Disappearance of Pamela Tinsley. The North Canadian River is a tributary of the Canadian River, sometimes referred to as the South Canadian River. Stretching over 400 miles, flowing in a mostly eastward direction, The North Canadian winds and twists its way through New Mexico, the Texas Panhandle, and Oklahoma. Drawing near to Oklahoma City, the river meets the Overholzer Dam, where in 1919, a 1,500-acre reservoir was constructed and eventually became known as Lake Overholzer. Sitting five miles northwest of downtown Oklahoma City, the lake has been a popular gathering spot for locals and visitors alike offering a wide array of activities from fishing and swimming to hiking and bike riding. On a hot spring or summer day, the lake is surrounded by people looking to relax, take in some sun, and cool off in the gentle waters. Today, the lake is surrounded by an assortment of areas and activities focusing in on family fun and sightseeing. A children's playground sits to the west, a wildlife refuge to the north. The dam, located along the southern end, draws in a lot of people who are seeking out beautiful views or maybe some light fishing in the spillways. Many reviews of the lake make mention of the friendly atmosphere and recommend hiking around the lake, an adventure which most describe as taking no longer than two hours. While today, 
Many see the lake as a fun and exciting place to hang out with friends and family. More than 30 years ago, it was at the heart of a mystery which continues to remain one of Oklahoma's most haunting, unsolved disappearances. On a lazy Sunday afternoon in April of 1986, 19-year-old Pamela Tinsley decided she needed a break from the stress of her busy life. On that unseasonably warm afternoon, Pam loaded up her Volkswagen pickup and made the 30-minute drive from her apartment. She'd park on the west side of the lake in an area known as the Flats. It was an out-of-the-way spot mostly populated by local teenagers looking for a quiet location to hang out, drink, and have a good time. Dressed in a blue bikini with black polka dots, Pamela slid into a pair of white shorts, strapped on her flip-flops, and looked forward to having an afternoon where she didn't have to worry about anything other than the heat of the sun, the cool of the water, and the feel of the wind. Or was there more to it than that? Had Pamela come up to the lake looking for a calm, relaxing day to just enjoy the weather? Or had she come to Lake Overholzer with a task in mind? For more than three decades, the exact details of why Pamela went there and what exactly happened have remained elusive. The only thing that is known for certain is that Pamela never made it home that night. In fact, she never even made it back to her pickup. According to witnesses, the last time they saw the 19-year-old was when she climbed onto the back of a motorcycle for a quick loop around the lake. Neither she nor the man she accepted the ride from have ever been seen again. Although, depending on who you ask, he may never have even existed in the first place. Pamela Dawn Tinsley was born on Wednesday, May 18, 1966, to parents Howard and Margie in Spencer, Oklahoma. Pamela, or Pam as she was most commonly known, was the Tinsleys' third child, growing up with both an older brother and older sister. From the moment of her birth, Pam captured the attention of family and strangers alike, with her pale porcelain complexion framed by hair so blonde it was nearly white. Bright blue eyes set off her features, giving her a unique look that would be the subject of both delight and pain for Pam as she developed into an adult. In the early 1970s, when Pam was seven years old, her family picked up stakes, moving north out of Spencer and settling in what was, at the time, the quickly developing city of Edmond. Part of the Oklahoma City metropolitan area, Edmond would experience a population explosion over the next few decades seeing the number of residents increasing from 16,000 in 1970 to more than 50,000 by 1990. As a result of the constant influx of new residents, homes, apartments, stores, and schools were being constructed on a regular basis in an attempt to keep pace with the demands of an ever-expanding city. Pam's father, Howard, worked for the Oklahoma Publishing Company and was involved in real estate, while her mother, Margie, worked as a school teacher and would go on to be involved in the leadership of the Association of Classroom Teachers. Pam grew up in a close-knit, loving home and, as the baby of the family, was often looked out for and taken care of by both her parents and her siblings. Unfortunately, Pam didn't have it all that easy as a child often finding herself the target of insults and jokes at the hands of her peers who frequently commented about her ashen skin and that shock of whitish blonde hair. According to her family, the harassment began as early as third grade when the youngster had rushed home from school crying her eyes out about another student who had continually called her an albino. Not much would change over the next few years as the cruelness and taunting and teasing of classmates frequently goes uncorrected. For many years, Pam had endured the insults slung at her by other students, and while she developed a close circle of friends, as anyone who has ever attended high school knows, popularity is not necessarily a bulwark against harassment. In an article published by the Daily Oklahoman, Friends and family commented about how Pam's lack of confidence in herself, both physically and mentally, affected her life. The constant torment revolving around her appearance did a masterful job of wearing away her belief in herself. As she grew older and developed, she often wore looser-fitting clothing in order to conceal her figure, but there was no solid answer for her skin tone and hair. Pam was so insecure about her appearance that she wouldn't even tan, 
not wanting anyone to see her in a bathing suit, nor wanting to let anyone know that their comments had bothered her in the first place. In addition to issues with her physical appearance, Pam had struggled in school. While she was intelligent and interested, there seemed to be something in the way which stopped her from achieving to the best of her abilities. Ultimately, she would be diagnosed with what today is known as an auditory processing disorder, or APD. Affecting 3-5% to of school children, APD is diagnosed when a student has difficulty noting small differences in word sounds. For instance, a sentence such as, come to the front of the class, may be heard by the student as, come to the hunt of the bass. According to WebMD, APD is not connected to hearing loss, nor is it a commentary on intelligence or ability, but more so a general disorder in which the brain simply doesn't hear sounds in the usual way. I imagine, while even today APD is easy to miss, this was likely even harder to detect when Pam would have been attending school in the 70s and 80s. Pam's mother, Margie, described her daughter as somewhat of a rebel who elected not to participate in many school activities, not because she couldn't, but because she didn't want to. Both of Pam's older siblings were very active in school and sports, described by their parents as gifted athletes. Her older brother, Barry, for instance, was an all-state football and baseball player who was nominated for the Jim Thorpe Award, granted each year to the best defensive back in college football. But Pam's lack of participation, again, didn't come out of an inability. As her father told the Oklahoman in 2008, quote, In a way, I thought Pam was the best athlete. She could do just about anything, but she wouldn't do it. End quote. Perhaps as a result of the teasing and harassment she'd faced throughout her life, Pam had a soft spot for those who were picked on and treated poorly. She stood up for those who couldn't stand up for themselves and drew a hard line, never turning a deaf ear to any kind of taunting, no matter who was the subject. As her mother put it, quote, I think she was always a fighter for the underdog. I think if anybody could say anything about her, that would be the thing. End quote. Pam would go on to attend Edmund Memorial High School, where she joined up with a vocational school for career training. Each day she'd arrive at school, then hop on the bus to the Francis Tuttle Technology Center, where she focused in on the skill of drafting. It was on this bus ride that she'd meet and befriend Naressa Radford. Naressa and Pam became fast friends, with the former standing up for Pam against continued harassment. Naressa later explained, quote, She was being picked on because, you know, she was blonde and busty, and I just told her to ignore them, and they'd stop. End quote. The two teens got along well, and their friendship solidified rapidly. They began doing everything together, from hanging out to attending classes and posing for yearbook photos. For Naressa, she believed she'd found someone truly special in Pam, later explaining to the Oklahoman, quote, She was just awesome. She was going to be a lifelong friend. End quote. In a disturbing twist of fate, this statement would come true, as Pam's life would be extinguished less than two years after she had graduated from high school. Before moving further, I feel I should just quickly address this. Much of Pam's life, as is true with many of the details of her final hours, are lost somewhere in the utter lack of information available. From her years in high school to her time after, there appears to be a large gap between what is known publicly and what has never been revealed. What we do know is that, following her graduation from high school, Pam moved out on her own, leasing an apartment in the city of Edmond. She picked up work at the Daily Oklahoman, where she would wake up early each morning and drive her route, delivering papers. According to co-workers, Pam was a fun, polite, and kind woman who was noted as always being punctual and reliable. Perhaps one of the most mysterious aspects of Pam's life comes in the form of her relationships. Not much has ever been shared about men she may have dated, but in the spring of 1986, when she was 19 years old, Pam was engaged. According to friends and family, her fiancé was in the military and was stationed out of the state during the last months of Pam's life, but the two kept in touch by exchanging letters on a nearly weekly basis. Pam appeared devoted to this man and was looking forward to marrying him and creating a life together. At the time, 
Her parents described him as a nice and polite young man who they thought was a good fit for their daughter. Pam was renting a small one-bedroom apartment, but somehow or another, she managed to pick up roommates, though this may not have been exactly what she wanted. No one seems to know exactly how this arrangement came to be, though people close to Pam have stated repeatedly that the 19-year-old wasn't happy with the people in her apartment and wanted to get rid of them. The Oklahoman described the group as a woman, her boyfriend, and another man. At least in terms of the boyfriend, he was described as a large, intimidating man with a lot of tattoos and a criminal record. He had reportedly served time in California, possibly in relation to a charge of burglary. According to Naressa, these three so-called roommates were really more along the lines of freeloaders who didn't contribute anything towards the rent or utilities and apparently were living out of Pam's apartment regardless of whether or not she agreed. Naresa would later state that the previously mentioned man creeped her out and she didn't like being around him. It was, in fact, Pam who would apparently confide in her that the man had confessed to being an ex-con. No one could really wrap their heads around what was happening as Pam didn't generally hang around with people like this, but somehow they'd come to be in her life. Whether this was due to her being tied into some possible illegal activities or if she was threatened or intimidated into agreeing to the arrangement has never been determined, or if it has, no one has officially commented on it. According to Naressa, as well as Pam's parents, she was growing more and more annoyed by the freeloaders and wanted them out. Naressa stated that she'd encouraged her to kick them out, but Pam seemed somewhat hesitant. Either she was trying to avoid a potentially volatile confrontation regarding the rental agreement, or she had reason to be scared of one, if not all, of the people in her apartment. It was a tense situation, which was about to get far worse. In the latter half of March, Pam would be awakened by a surprising knock on her door, which, to this day, may sit at the core of this disturbing and haunting mystery. Reportedly, Pam awoke early one morning to head into work and begin delivering newspapers. After a long and difficult shift, she was growing more and more excited at the prospect of getting back to her place. She was tired, wanted a shower, and really just hoped to relax and take it easy. After getting back to her apartment, she walked in, got cleaned up, and climbed into bed. Not long after pulling the blankets up and drifting off to sleep, she was awakened by a series of loud bangs on the door. Approaching it slowly, half-wiping sleep out of her eyes, she was shocked to find an Edmund police officer on the other side. The officer apparently entered the apartment and began looking around. At one point, he had Pam lead him back into her bedroom, where he continued going through her things, looking under the bed and pulling open drawers. Finally, he directed Pam to open her closet, where the officer discovered a marijuana plant. At the time, Pam was arrested and taken out of her apartment, but here is where things get really strange. While the Oklahoma City police have stated that Pam was arrested and charged with cultivating marijuana, the Edmond Police Department alleges that they don't have any records of her ever being arrested or charged with anything. This led many to one of two potential theories. Either Pam's arrest was voided, perhaps in exchange for her participation in catching a bigger fish, or because the man at her door that morning was not actually a police officer. According to Naressa, Pam was adamant that the marijuana found in her closet did not belong to her, though she doesn't seem to have shared any information about who may have been using her apartment for a grow operation. Naressa would tell the Oklahoman that while Pam was questioned by police, she was released. Now, I don't know about you, but in my experience, if you're caught with a marijuana plant growing in your closet, the police don't just question you and kick you free unless they're getting something out of it. Perhaps at 19 years old, Pam was scared enough with potential charges to agree to something that may not have been in her best interest, working as an informant for the authorities. This has never been confirmed, but given the nature of this bizarre situation, there are a few other options that make more sense. Naressa, for her part, was shocked by the arrest. She had known Pam for several years. The two were close, close enough that they shared everything with each other. But Pam had apparently never mentioned anything about drugs to her friend, 
nor had she ever said anything that would have made Naressa suspicious that she could have been involved with drugs or with drug dealers. Again, as this case continues to evolve, the more information you uncover, the less it all seems to fit together. It appears, quite clearly, that there's a lot going on here between the lines, and people either don't have information or are working overtime to conceal any information they may possess. A few weeks later, on Saturday, April 12th, Pam and Naressa spent a little time together. Pam again maintained her position that the marijuana found in her closet was not hers. She also began complaining again about the three people living rent-free in her apartment. Naressa, wanting to help her friend, told her again that she just needed to confront them and tell them to get out. Pam agreed that her friend was right, though she also acknowledged that she needed a little time to herself before addressing the issue. Whether this was buying time to build up the courage for the discussion or simply the results of a 19-year-old under severe stress, she explained to Naressa that she'd take care of everything, but first, she needed a break. She needed some time to think. She needed to go to Lake Overholzer. The afternoon of Sunday, April 13th, 1986, was a hot, breezy day in Oklahoma City. As is common with Oklahoma Springs, the day began with temperatures lingering in the low 60s, but by 12 p.m., the heat of the sun had driven them up into the upper 70s, peaking at 79 degrees by 2 p.m. That morning, Pam dressed in a turquoise bikini with black polka dots, white shorts, and flip-flops. Climbing into her Volkswagen pickup truck, she left her apartment, located in North Edmond, and made the 30-minute drive southwest towards the lake. Arriving in Oklahoma City, Pam drove over to the west side of the lake and parked her truck at the Flats, a spot she had been to many times in the past. While at the lake, Pam apparently ran into two friends who were also there looking to enjoy a lazy Sunday afternoon. I should note that nearly every detail we know about Pam's disappearance comes from these two friends, from what she was wearing to when she was last seen. I point this out because calling them friends might be a bit of a stretch. According to the official missing persons report later filed with the Oklahoma City Police, the two friends were actually the man and woman who were living in Pam's apartment, two of the people she desperately wanted to get rid of. Both of their addresses on the report are listed as being the same as Pam's, so keep that in mind. Since authorities have never publicly named these two witnesses, I am going to refer to them by the names Brad Homer and Terry Allen. According to all reports printed about this afternoon, the circumstances surrounding Pam's disappearance goes as follows. While down at Lake Overholzer, Pam encounters both Brad and Terry. An unknown man is seen riding around the lake on a motorcycle described by Brad and Terry as a medium blue Kawasaki, either 650 or 750 cc. Reportedly, the bike may have had out-of-state license plates, though that's never been confirmed. Ultimately, one of two scenarios develops. Either this unknown man on the bike stops to talk with Pam, or Pam sees him and waves him down, calling him over. At that time, the man offers to give Pam a ride around the lake, or she specifically asks him if he can give her a ride around. Naressa would later explain her understanding of this encounter to the Oklahoman, saying, quote, From what I know, a guy came up, supposedly out of state tags, but nobody could say. She'd been talking to him, and he finally was telling her, If you want a ride, come on, let's go now. End quote. According to investigators, Pam handed her purse to one of her friends before getting on the bike. At least one of the witnesses told detectives that after getting on the bike, but before riding off, Pam could distinctly be heard asking, you're going to bring me back, right? At that time, the man rode off with Pam and neither returned. There's a couple of issues with this account, as noted by investigators, Naressa, and Pam's parents. Firstly. Pam still struggled with her own body image, and almost no one who knew her believes that she would have accepted a ride on that motorcycle, let alone even been walking around the lake that day, without some kind of a top. She had shorts over her bikini, but the absence of any kind of a cover-up or t-shirt seems to stand at odds with Pam's normal behavior. In addition, Pam was a smoker, who always kept her cigarettes with her. 
It's been difficult for some to accept that she would have handed her purse over to a friend while she went for this ride, but wouldn't have taken her cigarettes along. Surely, it could have happened this way, but it doesn't make much sense for those closest to her. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you were at the lake and your friend left her stuff with you saying she was going to take a quick ride on a motorcycle with this stranger, wouldn't you be somewhat concerned when she never came back? Well, then you wouldn't have a lot in common with her so-called friends because they weren't concerned at all. In fact, after an unspecified amount of time, they just decided to go home. Remember, this is a lake you can walk around in two hours or less. How long would it really take to loop around it on a motorcycle? At no point did these friends try to track down Pam, nor did they reach out to any of her friends or family about the fact that she'd never come back. While investigators are told that it wasn't uncommon for Pam to go off with strangers when she was at the lake, no one in her life seems to agree with that. She wasn't the type to be trusting of strangers, not to mention she had a fiancé who she was excited to marry, so going off with a random guy just doesn't fit her personality. Many people believe that Pam, or one of those friends, had to have known who this man was. That Sunday comes to an end without any trace of Pam. She never gets back to the apartment. She never contacts any of her friends or family. She's simply gone. And at this point in time, the only people who know are these friends she was supposedly hanging out with. Seemingly unconcerned about this strange development, they went about the rest of their day, returned to the apartment, and went to sleep. The next morning, Pam fails to show up for work. According to coworkers, it was highly unusual for her to not come in, especially without calling to alert them that she was sick or wasn't going to be able to make it. This absence was so out of character that one of her bosses called her apartment trying to track her down. When those calls went unanswered, he then dialed her parents, informing them of the situation. So, approximately 14 hours after she was last seen, her parents are now made aware that there's a problem. The first thing Howard and Margie did was speak to Pam's roommates to find out what went on that day at the lake. Then, upon hearing this story about the guy on the motorcycle, Margie contacted the Oklahoma City Police to report her daughter missing. In a moment, I'll read from the official report, but I quickly want to note, witness number one is Brad Homer. Witness number two is Terry Allen. The report will also address a third witness who I will also provide a pseudonym. The report reads as follows, quote, Margie Tinsley stated that her daughter, Pam Tinsley, has been missing since April 13th, 1986 at 2 p.m., Ms. Tinsley stated that witness number one and witness number two were friends of her daughter, and they were all at Lake Overholzer at the time. She said that her daughter got on the back of the described motorcycle with the described subject and did not return to the lake or her home since then. Ms. Tinsley said that witness number one, Brad Homer, told her that a friend of his named Marco George saw her get on the cycle and ride off. No other information on George at this time. Ms. Tinsley stated that it was very unusual for her daughter not to call nor not to show up for work. Marco George possibly knows the subject on motorcycle. End quote. So now, the story's a little different. First, Pam got on the motorcycle with this stranger, handed over her purse, and rode off. Now she's gotten onto the motorcycle with a man who may or may not be known to at least one person who was hanging out with her on the lake that day. This third person, Marco George, would have been 17 years old at the time. It's also curious that, included in the missing person's paperwork, only Brad and Terry are listed as witnesses, including a description of the motorcycle. But then Margie claims that Brad told her it was this other guy, Marco, who actually saw Pam get on the bike. As I said earlier, there's not a lot in this case that adds up or makes a whole lot of sense. Unfortunately, as was often the case in the 80s and sometimes is still the case today, when police take this report, they fall back on their standard response. She's an adult. She hopped on a motorcycle with some random guy. She'll probably come back when she's good and ready. As a result of what I can only describe as severe inaction from investigators, Pam's family and friends take it upon themselves to try and find her. On Monday, April 14th, 
The day the missing persons report is filed, Pam's parents create missing persons flyers and head down to the lake to hand them out and to try and track down who exactly was there that day and who Pam may have known. Margie later explained to the Oklahoman, quote, it can be really frustrating because sometimes they don't know each other's last names or they have nicknames they go by, end quote. The flyers handed out by the family included a photo of Pam as well as her description. Also on the flyer was a description of the motorcyclist. According to the flyer, he was a white male standing 5 feet 10 to 6 feet tall and weighing between 180 and 200 pounds. The driver had brown hair and possibly a mustache. He's listed as being 25 to 30 years old and was wearing a t-shirt and sunglasses. This is somewhat interesting as descriptions of the driver's age will change with the Oklahoma City Police later stating that he was far younger, more than likely between the ages of 19 and 23. Unfortunately, the family's efforts towards finding Pam don't fare very well, and by Friday, April 18th, five days after Pam was last seen, she's officially listed by the Oklahoma City Police on their missing persons list. Whether or not any major searches were conducted for Pam, I can't honestly say, as if they did occur, they weren't publicized, and I haven't found mention of them anywhere else. It's been suggested by some close to the case that, being that Pam got on the motorcycle, they didn't organize searches of the lake area because there was a good chance she was driven somewhere else. For the most part, coverage of this case is very thin, and the actions of investigators in the first weeks is not directly addressed. On Thursday, April 24th, 11 days after Pam disappeared, the Oklahoma City Police officially announced their belief that she has been the victim of a homicide. Lieutenant Bob Jones explains to the Oklahoman, quote, There's not much doubt in my mind that she's dead. We're telling her parents to prepare for the worst, end quote. Lieutenant Jones was then the head of the homicide division who were given Pam's file after it was transferred out of missing persons. According to Jones, investigators were focusing on two possible scenarios. He explained, quote, Either she's still with the guy and she'll come home when she's good and ready, or else she was dead within an hour after she left with him. Realistically, that's what we're looking at. We don't know that she's dead, but statistically, on a deal like that, where she apparently had every intention of returning, it doesn't look good. End quote. Asked about the man on the motorcycle, Lieutenant Jones wasn't very optimistic about the reports given from witnesses, namely Brad Homer and Terry Allen. Jones explained, saying, quote, Those witnesses wouldn't recognize him from the man on the moon. We don't have a thing to hang our hat on. End quote. I imagine you're expecting a lot more information about this investigation, but sadly, it seems to grow cold almost immediately. While Pam's friends and family continued the fight to keep her name in the papers and to try and track her down, there wouldn't come any major updates or developments until 22 years later, when in May of 2008, an anonymous person placed several phone calls claiming to have pertinent information about Pam's disappearance. When Pamela vanished in April of 1986, she was just 19 years old. Many have found it fascinating that these anonymous calls came in around mid-May of 2008, when Pam should have been celebrating her 42nd birthday. According to Oklahoma City cold case inspector Kyle Eastridge, an anonymous person called in to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMEC, and passed on several pieces of information about Pam's disappearance. That same caller, or someone who sounded very similar, later called back and gave additional details. The Oklahoma City Police also received three to four calls asking questions about the case around this time, possibly the same person wanting to see if their information had been passed on. Police managed to track down the location of the calls, but Eastridge felt there was something unusual about them. He explained to the Oklahoman, quote, They're coming from a restaurant in the Tulsa area. It sounds like it's the same caller, but it sounds like it's someone who is being fed information from a person standing nearby, end quote. So, someone who may possess information about this case is possibly using another person as a go-between, feeding them information which this middleman then speaks into the phone. Why exactly would someone do that? 
either to conceal their own voice, perhaps because it could be recognized or might give away information, or because they don't want to be involved in this investigation. Considering what happened to Pam, maybe this person has good reason to be afraid of talking. While investigators wouldn't release much of the information they received, Inspector Eastridge did tell reporters that the caller gave them a suspect's name, as well as a general location where Pam's remains were likely to be found. The location wasn't given specifically, but it has been said that it's a pond somewhere northwest of Oklahoma City. Asked about the case and the original reports that Pam had gotten onto the stranger's motorcycle and rode off, Inspector Eastridge was highly suspicious of the story. Eastridge explained, quote, I believe that she probably did get on a motorcycle and leave the group, but I think there was probably more to it than that. We've got some ideas of the people who may have been involved in her death, and we're going to give them the opportunity to come forward and be treated like witnesses. If we have to go find them, then they're going to be suspects. End quote. Eastridge stated that there was no evidence that Pam had chosen to run off, and in fact, all of the evidence seemed to point in the opposite direction. She didn't come back for her pickup truck. She didn't bring any clothes with her. She left her purse behind. Beyond that, neither her credit cards nor her bank account were ever used after Sunday, April 13th, 1986. While they weren't exactly overwhelmed with evidence, Eastridge felt that everything they knew suggested foul play. The question they couldn't answer, however, was why? Could it have been something as small as trying to evict the freeloaders in her apartment? Or was it somehow tied to that marijuana plant found in her closet? If indeed it wasn't hers, she may have known whose it was. And that person might have had reason to be concerned with what she was telling the police. While Eastridge couldn't disclose many details about the investigation to that point in time, he was willing to share another curious piece of information. According to him, while the investigation had initially followed the theory that Pam had been killed by one person, developments over the years have now led them to believe that accomplices were involved. They may have assisted in the murder, or perhaps they were only involved in moving and disposing of Pam's body. For her part, Naressa agreed with Eastridge that the original story never made much sense to her, telling the Oklahoman, quote, From day one, I was really not about the stranger thing. I really suspected people around her, end quote. After this news of the anonymous call broke, the Oklahoman reached out to Pam's parents. During a discussion with them, they discovered something that seemingly no one was aware of earlier. Pam's parents had in their possession a series of letters that Pam's then fiance had sent to her during their correspondence in 1986. For reasons only a parent stricken with grief can fully understand, they had never opened those letters. Hoping for something, in June of 2008, they finally decided to take a look, and they were absolutely shocked by what they found. The letters written by the fiancé were loaded with requests for Pam to send him nude photographs. While this isn't all that strange for a fiancé who's away in the military, it was his other requests that really stood out. The fiancé had specifically asked Pam if she'd be able to send him drugs. In some letters, he asked for hits of acid. In others, he requested ecstasy, which by the mid-80s was becoming a huge drug in the club and bar scene. In one letter, he noted having served 30 days in the brig, though he didn't explain what the offense was. The fiancé also seemed to have responded to Pam, who had mentioned the people living in her apartment, joining in the long line of people in her life that advised her to kick them out. This information was a revelation for the family. Suddenly, the questions surrounding that marijuana plant in the closet started seeming much more important. While Pam had sworn it didn't belong to her, if indeed she was involved in supplying any kind of drugs to her fiancé, she may have found herself spending time around people who weren't exactly the most trustworthy. Also, perhaps, the kind of people who might not feel comfortable knowing she was arrested for growing the plant, but walked free. Was this what it had all been about? Could Pam have been killed because of her possible connection to drug runners? While her family struggled to accept Pam could have done any of this, 
one specific letter in the stack would provide some perspective. Among the letters from her fiancé, Howard and Margie found one written by Pam herself. Dated Friday, April 11th, 1986, Pam had written it less than 48 hours before her mysterious disappearance. In the letter, she responds to her fiancé's request for drugs, noting that she might be able to get some ecstasy from her brother, adding that she'd never actually tried it herself. I think it's worth noting that Pam's brother, who sadly passed away in 2005 at the age of 43, was charged in 1988 with possession of a controlled dangerous substance, the same charge Pam would have faced regarding that marijuana plant in her closet. He was ultimately given one year's probation. After reading the letters, the Tinsleys felt they might finally have a better idea of what happened to their daughter, wondering if perhaps the entire disappearance was orchestrated by her roommates in regard to her plans to evict and perhaps their own connections to the drug world. Howard later explained to the Oklahoman, quote, I'd hate to think this whole thing is over her telling someone to move out, but things like that have happened, end quote. Now, this is where things take another interesting turn. Digging into the backgrounds of Pam's former freeloading roommates, you know, the witnesses to her disappearance who were described in local papers as friends, you find some disturbing details. Brad Homer, for instance, has a long record of criminal charges stemming back to the 80s, and the vast majority of them are listed by Oklahoma authorities as possession of controlled dangerous substances with intent to distribute. There are also charges for possession of controlled substances and unlawful possession of drug paraphernalia. Terry Allen, who was allegedly dating Homer when Pam disappeared, seems to be clean and, according to my searches, left Oklahoma in the mid-90s, never returning. But there is another name, and his record only adds to the intrigue and mystery surrounding Pam's disappearance. Marco George has a criminal record related to drugs going as far back as 1989, at least, when he would have been 23 years old. Remember, he was 17 when Pam disappeared, and is also named in the original missing persons report as witnessing Pam getting on the stranger's motorcycle. In November of 1991, five years after Pam's disappearance, Marco was arrested for selling 29.6 grams of cocaine to a confidential police informant. Even more interestingly, he was arrested alongside another man, a William Allen. After their arrests, police searched their apartment where they lived together and seized 700 hits of ecstasy and a kilo of cocaine. Now, if the last name Allen rings a bell for you, it should, since one of the people in Pam's apartment was Terry Allen. While I cannot confirm that Terry and William are closely related, record checks have shown that they share multiple relatives and maybe cousins. As it turns out, William Allen has not only been charged with drug-related offenses, but has also faced charges of first- and second-degree murder. So you have a mysterious marijuana plant found in Pam's bedroom closet, one which she claims doesn't belong to her. You have a cop showing up seemingly out of nowhere searching for the plant. Someone must have tipped him off, right? Could it have been one of those roommates who maybe didn't want to get evicted or maybe wanted to get revenge on Pam for planning to evict them? You have her fiancé who's asking her to send drugs and she's spending her time with drug dealers and drug users. Speaking of the roommates, you've got Terry Allen who's dating Brad Homer. Brad has a record involving arrest for possession, intent to distribute, burglary, and passing bad checks. His friend, Marco George, is later arrested for possession with intent to distribute as well as for smuggling drugs across the southern border. He's arrested with William Allen, a relative of Terry's who's charged with drug-related crimes and later, murder. As it turns out, these people may have been far more dangerous than any motorcyclist Pam encountered that Sunday afternoon, unless, of course, that motorcyclist was also a part of that group. So was Naressa right in her belief that the true answer to Pam's fate has more to do with the people around her than anyone on a motorcycle? It's impossible to say for certain, but I think looking at the people that were around Pam when she vanished, the ones who were witnesses to the motorcyclist encounter with friends like that who needs enemies. Pamela Dawn Tinsley is described as being a white female with blonde, almost white hair 
and blue eyes, standing 5 feet 7 inches tall and weighing 130 pounds. Pam's ears are pierced, and she has a mole on the left side of her mouth. At the time of her disappearance, she was a smoker. When last seen, Pam was apparently wearing a two-piece turquoise bathing suit with black polka dots, flip-flops, white shorts, and a size 7 gold ring with a diamond. She was reportedly last seen on the west side of Lake Overholzer in an area known as the Flats. According to the story told by her roommates, Pam was last seen climbing onto the back of a late 70s model Kawasaki motorcycle, medium blue, either a 650 or 750 cc. The driver has been described as a white male, 5 feet 10 inches to 6 feet tall and weighing between 180 and 200 pounds. He had brown hair and possibly a mustache. He was in his late teens or early 20s, and his bike may have had out-of-state plates. 36 years have passed since Pam Tinsley mysteriously vanished on a warm Sunday afternoon in April of 1986. More than two decades later, an anonymous caller reported multiple details about the case to investigators, but as of yet, they've been unable to substantiate the caller's claims. It seems that someone out there has far more information about Pam's disappearance and could not only aid investigators in their search for Pam and her likely killers, but they could also help alleviate some of the bitter grief and pain the family has suffered through by helping them to locate her remains so she can receive a proper burial. No matter how much time has passed, they're never going to give up hope of someday bringing their daughter home and seeing those responsible for her disappearance charged for their crimes. Asked their thoughts all those years later, her parents expressed their hope, saying, quote, There's not a day that goes by that we don't think of our daughter. I believe now that she's passed away, but I would like to find out the circumstances. We're not wanting revenge or anything. We would like to know where she is. There's just no closure to it. On a quiet Sunday afternoon, 19-year-old Pamela Tinsley went down to Lake Overholzer and never returned. For more than 20 years, detectives followed a theory that she'd been abducted by one person, a man who she allegedly took a motorcycle ride with, who never brought her back. Then, in 2008, an anonymous tipster provided investigators with additional information about the case, and for the first time, it was theorized that maybe Pam's disappearance wasn't as cut and dry as it had originally seemed. Perhaps she did hop on a motorcycle with someone, but maybe he wasn't a stranger. Maybe her roommates were cooperating witnesses, or perhaps they were people with something to gain by Pam's disappearance. Pam's case is one that I've been looking into for a long time. I've wanted to cover it for years, but always ran into the roadblock of very limited information. Originally, I was with detectives. It seemed pretty clear that she'd taken a ride from someone who obviously had dark intentions, but the deeper I dug into things, the more it began to fall in line with Naressa's belief that the people close to Pam that day either have more information than they've shared, or they were directly involved in what became of Pam. What at first seems like a fairly straightforward case gets turned on its head when you begin digging into the people that were around her the day she vanished. Unwanted roommates, two of which have ties to drug trafficking and other crimes. Between Brad Homer and Marco George, you've got enough drug charges to write an entire episode just about them. When you factor in the connection to William Allen, who's later charged with drug offenses and eventually murder, the story changes shape dramatically. I think, at the end of the day, what makes this disappearance so difficult to figure out is that the only witnesses you have to the motorcycle story are the roommates who I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw them. So it becomes a question of what really happened that day. Did Pam go down to the lake of her own volition, encountering these roommates who just happened to be there and then, randomly, agreeing to take a ride on a motorcycle with a total stranger? Well, first things first. We don't know if this guy was a total stranger, assuming he existed at all. In his own statement, Brad said that Marco may have known the guy on the motorcycle. If that was the case, then he must not have ever told police a name because they never listed anyone. Also, you'd have to imagine that if Marco did know this guy, how would Brad and Terry not have? 
At the time, Marco was 17 years old. William Allen, who will later be arrested with possession and intent to distribute, will also be charged with murder. Well, in 1986, he'd have been 16 or 17 years old himself. Makes perfect sense to me that he would have been hanging around Marco at that time. I haven't been able to determine if William ever owned a motorcycle, but if I'm being totally honest, I find the entire motorcycle story hard to believe in the first place. Pam doesn't like these roommates. She knows what they're up to. She wants them out of her life. She goes down to the lake for a breather to get away from all the stress revolving around them and the marijuana plant. So she hangs out with them and takes a ride from one of their friends. Does that make sense to anyone? The idea that these people may have wanted Pam out of the picture due to the looming eviction doesn't really make sense either. Sure, people have killed over less, but given the choice between killing Pam because she was going to throw them out or killing Pam because she may have been planning to tell police who the real owner of that marijuana plant was, I think it's an easy decision to make. In the end, it seems to me that Pam found herself caught up in a world she wasn't equipped to deal with and surrounded by dangerous people she may not have recognized until it was too late. We know that Pam's fiancé was in the military and was out of state when she disappeared. However, we know from the letters that he was asking her to send him drugs. It's not hard to imagine that Pam could have easily ended up tangled with these people in part because she was trying to get her fiancé what he was asking for. In the one letter we have from her, she mentions potentially getting ecstasy through her brother. Who else do we know that has a connection to ecstasy? Well, Marco George, who when arrested in 1991, had 700 hits of ecstasy in the apartment he shared with William Allen. Now, there's never been anything suggesting that Pam's brother was involved, and I highly doubt he would have been. But as someone with an older brother, I could see asking him where to go to get certain things and being directed towards a particular person or group of people. But maybe Pam found them on her own. Either way, in trying to get drugs for her fiancé, she puts herself directly in the line of danger. But the story doesn't end there. We have this bizarre encounter where an Edmund police officer apparently shows up at her apartment and already seems to know about the marijuana plant growing in the closet. How exactly did he know it was there? The only answer is that someone had to have told the police, or particularly this officer. Here's the thing, though. We don't know who this cop was. We don't know exactly when this incident occurred. And according to the Edmund PD, they have no record of Pam ever being arrested or charged with anything. Perhaps if we knew more about it, we could figure something out. Was Pam actually taken down to the station and questioned, or was she questioned there at her apartment? In what scenario can you imagine a person being found growing marijuana in their apartment that doesn't result in an arrest? According to everything we know, Pam was questioned, then released. Now, I can't say anything with certainty, but it sounds like one of two scenarios. Either this guy was a really bad cop who didn't know what he was doing, which would be hard for him to have gotten to the apartment in the first place, or some kind of a deal may have been cut. Maybe Pam would have agreed to act as a confidential informant to the authorities, thus keeping her arrest off the record and assuming she does as she's asked, ensuring she never faces any charges. Could that have been why she wanted to go to the lake that day? Maybe there was someone there that she planned to meet up with, someone who she had gotten drugs through before. It sure would be a remarkable example of happenstance that the same day she goes down to the lake for this kind of activity, her drug-running roommates just happen to be there as well. It never made much sense to me that in the midst of this crisis in her life, between the marijuana plant and her freeloading roommates, that Pam's first thought would be, you know what, I'll take care of everything, but first, I really just need a lazy afternoon by the lake. That's purely speculative on my part, but like so much of this case, there's almost nothing that makes sense. If we're trying to establish motive, you have only two options given what we know. Either some random guy on a motorcycle just decided to abduct Pam, despite the fact that her roommates had seen him, despite the fact that they'd seen his bike, and despite the fact that one of them may have known him. He just figures he can get away with it, and it works out tremendously in his favor that neither Brad nor Terry can seem to provide much helpful information, and Marco may never have provided any. Sure, it could happen that way. Life can be incredibly bizarre, but it doesn't exactly pass the sniff test. The other possibility is that Pam was set up. Maybe there was a guy on a motorcycle. But perhaps the meeting wasn't happenstance and he was there not because he was interested, but because the roommates wanted him there. 
Maybe the original plan involved putting the marijuana plant in the closet and calling the cops to taint her name or discredit her should she ever want to talk to police about their activities, but the plan backfires. Knowing that she's arrested and walks free, it'd be pretty clear to anyone who's been around drug dealers that police don't just let you go when they've caught you red-handed. So I doubt it would have taken a long time to figure out what was happening, that Pam may have cut some kind of a deal or couldn't be trusted. Or maybe she directly said that to them. Maybe that was a part of the way she tried to evict them. Get the hell out of my apartment, or I'm going to tell the cops what you're up to. Maybe it's just me, but so many details of the original story we were given just sound like they were manufactured in order to throw investigators off the trail. They can't remember much about what the guy looked like, but oh yeah, he might have had out-of-state plates. That's a good way to convince police that your suspect might not be from around Oklahoma City, so don't dig too deeply in this area. Then there's the quote attributed to Pam as she gets onto the bike, asking the guy, you're going to bring me back, right? Are you going to take a ride with someone you supposedly don't know if the thought that he might not bring you back even enters your mind? I was an idiot when I was 19 years old, but even I wouldn't have fell for that. So Pam apparently hands her purse over to one of the roommates, never to be seen again. They don't find this concerning. They're not worried about her. They don't think anything of it. They don't notify police, call her parents, nothing. They just go back to the apartment, her apartment, and go to bed without a care in the world. Is that because they really believe she'd ride off with this stranger and just start a new life with them? Or could it be because they knew exactly what happened to her? We can't know for certain, but given their behavior after her disappearance, I'm not exactly feeling charitable enough to grant these folks any kind of slack. Something very strange is going on here, and I don't think we've ever gotten the full story. Then, you've got this anonymous caller. I wish they would have released the name of the suspect this person gave, the person they said killed Pam. I'd love to know if this person has any connection to Brad, Terry, Marco, or William. While we don't know much about this call, what we do know is that it causes the police to take a different approach. They no longer view this as a situation where one person abducted Pam, but one in which several accomplices were involved either directly with the murder or subsequently in terms of disposing of her remains. That makes this sound a hell of a lot more like someone planned a conspiracy to get rid of her rather than a random chance encounter with a guy on a motorcycle. So what do you believe happened? Did Pam really hop on a motorcycle with a complete stranger who felt confident and secure enough to abduct her despite being seen by her roommates? Or was Pam specifically targeted either due to that marijuana plant, her plans of evicting the freeloaders, or some combination of the two, or possibly for a reason we yet don't know? This case is truly a mess, and trying to find your way through it can be really difficult. But we know someone out there has more information. Someone out there has the ability to provide all of the answers. Why they've never called back, or why they didn't try harder, I honestly can't say. The truth of the matter is, where this case stands right now, there's not a lot investigators can do. They have suspects who they've never named, but no evidence. They have a theory, but no solid support. In the balance hangs the grief of a family that has suffered for 36 years, never knowing what became of their daughter, their sister, their aunt. If you are the anonymous caller or you possess information about this case, please take another step. Call in again, send an email, text in a tip, report it anonymously through Crime Stoppers. Hell, send me an email and I'll pass the message along. You have the ability to help, to assuage yourself of the guilt you feel, to rid yourself of this difficult knowledge. Wouldn't you want that done for you? Wouldn't you want someone to tell your parents, your siblings, your friends where they could find you? All the Tinsleys really want is to know what happened to their daughter and to give her a proper burial. You don't even have to turn in a suspect or tell them what happened. Just tell them where her body is. They can't find any answers unless you come forward. Because without more information and new evidence, the disappearance of Pamela Tinsley will remain open, unsolved and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Pamela Tinsley, there isn't a ton of resources out there. However, the Daily Oklahoman newspaper did the most extensive coverage, and this episode would not have been possible without their work. 
If you have any information about the disappearance of Pamela Tinsley, please contact the Oklahoma City Police Department at 405-297-1129. Her case number is 860-411-313. You can also report tips anonymously to Oklahoma Crime Stoppers by visiting the website okccrimetips.com. Dot com. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Trace Evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine. Ann Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakaisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levenin, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko. Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Adorable Susie Summers, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace evidence.com and click on the support option. This concludes our coverage of the disappearance of Pamela Tinsley, a case which seems so solvable and yet lingers just outside of investigators reach. I truly hope that sooner or later, some answers are found and that the anonymous caller picks up the phone again. I want to thank you again for listening And I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.